If you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, because that's where the scripture reading was, you're probably in good shape because we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, today, so it's probably on the same opening that you already are on. And if not, you can turn the page here in just a moment uh, when we get there. If you don't have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to get them out. Uh, open up to the letter of Paul uh, to the Corinthians that we call 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Uh, we'll be continuing our study there today. For those of you that are visiting with us, we have a number of you. We've been looking at the letter of 1 Corinthians, and we've been seeing that or viewing that with the idea that Paul is writing this letter uh, to this group, to this congregation, that actually has lots of good things going for it. We often think of 1 Corinthians as being a church that has all kinds of problems, and they do. They have problems that Paul is addressing. But remember, when he starts out, if you just were looking at the first nine verses, you would think, man, I want to be part of the church that's at Corinth. And we want to keep that in mind because that means that those churches that are blessed, those churches that have good things going for them, can still have issues that arise, problems that are going on uh, amongst them. And we need to be careful because we could very easily be uh, that church that's at Corinth. What we saw so far, Paul has been talking about this idea of the foolishness that's going on in Corinth because they're living after the wisdom of the world and not the wisdom which is of God. He says, God. God's wisdom, remember, uh, exceeds man's wisdom, and he's made that clear by pointing out that God has done something that no man would have decided to do, and that is that he chose the lowliest things, the foolish things, so that he could bring to nothing all of those things that man values. And the reason that Paul tells us God did that is because he's trying to make it so that no one individually can boast about how great they are, or how wise they are, because God has removed all of those things. And what that does then is it puts us all together uh, on equal footing, on equal ground. It makes us so that we should be unified one with another, which is the problem that was going on in Corinth, is that people were standing up and boasting, uh, and at least in their own mind, being puffed up and thinking they were better than one another. And we only understand this great thing that God has done and the great things that God has worked out, we looked at last time, because God has chosen to reveal those things things to us by his spirit. That's what Paul spends chapter two really talking about, that we understand this thing, not because we're so good, not because we're so smart or so clever, but only because God's spirit has searched out the deep parts of God and revealed them freely to us. What we ended up with last time then was what we just had the reading a moment ago, uh, was this idea of a difference between then the man who is considered the natural man and the man who is considered the spiritual man. We had that reading because really, remember, there aren't any chapter breaks in the original text, right? Paul just wrote a letter and he wouldn't have stopped right there and they wouldn't have stopped right there and said, well, that's good. That's enough for one week. Let's come back next week and have the reading of the rest of Paul's letter. But we must, for sake of time, unless you all want to hang out for, you know, 16 or so hours and do a marathon session, which as uh, I've often been told, right? The mind will not absorb, but the bottom cannot endure. Um, so we break it up, but Paul did not. And so we're going to pick back up in chapter 3, keeping in mind what Paul has just said about this natural man and this spiritual man. And we mentioned last time that that spiritual man that Paul is concerned with is not defined by the way the religious world likes to define spirituality today. If you ask many people today, many people to say that I'm not religious, but I consider myself to be spiritual. And what they mean by that is that, you know, I believe in God, or I believe in mysticism, or I believe in the things beyond the natural realm. But that's not how Paul uses that term, right? Paul uses that term as those that are spiritual are those that are mature, and they're mature because they've received the Spirit of God. Now, he's going to carry on this idea here in just a minute in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. And notice, it would be a strange thing for the Corinthians to hear what's coming next. Because Paul has just said, there's these guys that are carnal. There's these guys that are natural out there. They don't understand spiritual things. Then there's these people that are spiritual, and we have the mind of Christ. And if you're a Corinthian and you're hearing that, what do you expect to hear next? What you expect to hear next is more good things about me. More good things about how I am a spiritual man. But Paul begins in verse 1 of chapter 3 saying, And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as those that are spiritual. 
But instead, as to those that are carnal, even as babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with food, solid food or meat. For up until now, you were not able to bear it, and neither are you still now able. What Paul says right after he talks about the spiritual man and the natural man is he says, and you, Corinthians, you're not acting like spiritual people. I couldn't talk to you as spiritual people before. In fact, I had to treat you like babes in Christ. And even still now, you're acting that way. And that must have been quite a shock to the Corinthians who thought, oh, spiritual, yeah, that's us. We're doing really well. But instead, he turns that around on them. Now, what's the difference here between the person who is spiritual and the person who is carnal? Well, it's similar to how he was talking about that natural man and that spiritual man just a minute ago. Remember that the difference between the man who thought the things of God were foolishness and the man who thought the things of God were wisdom back in chapter 2 in verse 6 was that we speak wisdom to those who are mature, to those who are complete, to those who are perfect, right? And now Paul comes back down here again and he brings up this idea of growth and maturity once again, right? He says, you are babies. You are babes. You have to have milk and not solid food. Paul brings back up this idea of maturity in chapter 3, and he says those people who aren't mature in Christ, those people who haven't advanced along, might as well be the carnal man because they haven't grown up and put off the carnal things. Sometimes we like to think or we get in our head that the fact that I am spiritual, the fact that I have discerned the basic precepts of the things of the gospel, and the fact that I know them and have obeyed them means that I'm good to go when I'm finished. And what Paul says is that's just not the case. That's a good start. That's a good place to begin. But if we don't continue to grow up, and we get stuck in this state of spiritual immaturity, then he says, we're carnal. Growing up in Jesus Christ, becoming a mature person in the gospel, means that we must put off the carnal things. If we are holding on to the carnal things and thinking that that's okay, then Paul says, you've got it wrong. You're immature, you're a babe, Put those things away. As he continues into 3 and 4, then he says, For you are yet carnal. For as there is among you strife and envy and divisions, aren't you carnal and behaving like men? For while one says, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos, are you not acting as carnal or worldly people? What Paul tells them is, How do I know if I'm spiritual or if I'm carnal? How could I know that, Paul? How do you know that about me? Paul, how can you from far away say, I know that you're still babies? How do you know, Paul? What's the distinguishing factor? Well, Paul lays it out very simply and says, how are you acting? Right? And parents, you understand this. How many times have you said to your children, even if they are grown, right, you're acting like a two-year-old? And what do you mean by that? I've got some people smiling as though they might have said that today to some of their children out in the audience. (laughs) What we mean by that is if you're acting below your age, if you're behaving in a certain way, you might as well be that age, right? That's what we mean by that. What Paul says, interestingly enough, in fact, is he says, the reason that I know you're a baby in Christ is because you're acting like a grown man. And we go, wait, that's weird. What do you mean by that? We usually think that's a good thing, right? We usually think, grow up, be a man, act like a man. That's a good thing. What Paul is doing is he's flipping that around. And he's saying, if you're acting like a grown man in carnality, then you're acting like a baby in Jesus Christ. When we are mature in the things of the world, when we act like men, then what that makes us is children or babies in Christ. Now, we need to get our head around this because I will tell you that this is one of the largest problems that I see out in the world today amongst those people that claim to be religious. 
One of the largest problems among organized religion today is that there are people out there who claim to be people of God and yet believe that however I act makes no difference at all, right? I can do whatever I want and live however I want and be whoever I want and that doesn't mean that I'm not spiritual. Paul says that's ridiculous. However you act shows who you are. If you act like mere men, you are mere men. If you want to be grown up in Christ and spiritually mature, then you have to act grown up in Christ and spiritually mature. Now, what are those specifics that Paul is concerned with? Paul says, let me tell you how men act. And now, you know, he means worldly people, mankind in general. But the things he says, you could say that's how men act as well, right? I mean, the things that he lists there are what? Strife, envy, and division. How do men act? How do people act? That's it right there, right? You look at those three things, strife, envy, and division. I want you to think about them for just a second. Now, I want you to imagine that we had a world where there was no strife, envy, or division. What would that world look like? How would that world be if we could remove strife, envy, and division from mankind, what would the world look like? Aren't those three things really the three problems that are at the root of everything else? If we didn't have those, we wouldn't have trouble. And what Paul is saying is that's because those characteristics, those things define what it means to be worldly. That's what they are. And I would wager that any particular time that you run into some sort of problem with your fellow man, that at the root of it is one of those three things, right? It's either that there's just strife or contention, you're envious of what it is that they have, or they're envious of what it is that you have, or is there some sort of division between you about any sort of idea or thing? Now, Paul's particular concern here is that the church in Corinth has taken things which are even spiritual and has turned them into worldly things. They've taken these ideas of saying, these ministers which have come to us and taught us things and have become who I follow, have become, because I'm of Apollos and you're of Paul, we can't get along. Or my teacher is better than your teacher and you ought to be envious of me. And Paul says when we do those things and we're acting like the world acts. Now, don't get confused. No one out in the world says I'm of Apollos and you're of Paul and so we can't get along, right? That's not the things that they argue about. But it is the same thing. It's that my country is better than your country. My college is better than your college. My candidate is better than your candidate. My sports team is better than your sports team. It doesn't matter. My idea is better than your idea. The world is divided. And Paul says that shouldn't be happening in the kingdom of God. Those people that are kingdom citizens don't act that way. Because they're babes, because they're immature, because they can't understand these things, Paul says, I'm going to have to talk to you like your children. And so he does that providing, by providing two physical metaphors for them to help them understand what's going on. Those are listed down in verse uh, 9 where he says that you are God's husbandry and you are God's building. We're going to take a look at those metaphors here for just a minute. And the first one that he mentions there is that you are God's Field, beginning in verse 9. Paul's going to talk about that in 5, 6, 7, and 8, and he does that really to explain uh, the work of these ministers that they're so excited about and bragging about. But what we want to understand is really two things here. One, what does that mean about service and servants that we'll see in a minute? And two, realistically, most of us need to be concerned with the fact that we are God's field, right? That this building right here where we're sitting right now and all the people gathered around in it, we are a garden, right? So over here we got some corn planted and we got some wheat over here maybe and uh, some fruit in this section. We got some fruity people here. Uh, and then we got, uh, you know, uh, maybe this is just, um, I don't know, vegetables on this side, I think. 
right? We're God's garden. We're his field. And we don't think about that like uh, We don't think about ourselves like that very often, right? Because no one wants to be a vegetable. No one says, uh, no one wants to say, you know, I'm just a tree. That's all I am. We think of them as not important. But God says that's what we are. We're his field. And as he describes that in verses 5 through 8, this is what Paul has to say. He says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but servants or ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is the one that plants anything, neither is the one that waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man will receive his reward according to to his own labor. The first point we want to get out of what Paul is saying here is the point that he's talking about with servants that we really see there in verses 5 and verse 8. He gives this worldly, carnal, physical example to the people at Corinth so that they can understand. And he says, servants are servants. And we go, well, that doesn't seem very profound or very wise or very deep, but that's what he says, right? The person who plants and the person who waters, they're nobodies. They're servants. I didn't have someone plant and water for me recently, though I will send out my daughter very often to water for me. But yesterday, I had some guy come over and prune the trees in my backyard, right? They were all growing onto the roof, and I'm selling my house, and I got to get rid of those things that new buyers say so. So I had to pay someone to prune my backyard. So he was out in the front. He's our neighbor's garden guy. And I said, hey, come over and prune the trees in the backyard. And he went in and he did that and he took all the garbage away. And you know how much I thought about that? Not at all. I didn't think about that one bit. In fact, I didn't even know when he left. He was just gone. I was like, oh, well, I guess that job's finished. You know what I did not say afterwards? I did not say, I am of the gardener. Man, that guy was fantastic. Sign me up. I'm going to follow him everywhere he goes because he is the best tree trimmer I have ever seen. And he said, who do you look up to, Kevin? I said, I look up to the guy who trimmed my trees. It was amazing. I don't do that. You don't do that either, right? Why not? Because you go... He's just some guy I hired. He's just a servant. He's just someone that came along and took care of my plants. What's the big deal? And Paul says, exactly. Exactly. All these people that you're saying are so great and so worth following and so bragging about and dividing over, he says, that's silly because they're just servants. They're planters, they're waterers, and you know what? They don't really matter that much. And we'll see why in just a second, but what he says is even the things that they do, the skills that they have, the talents and the teachings they bring you, he says, are only as have been given to them by God anyway. Each one does according to what it is that God has given them, he says, right? The task, the talent, whatever it is that they're doing is because God has done that. And we need to keep in mind that that's the case. The other thing that's important for us to keep in mind about service and servants is this, that they will be recorded or rewarded according to their labor. Paul says those people who did things, Paul, Apollos, any of these other guys that came through you, they're going to get recorded, recorded, not recorded, rewarded, rewarded according to the labor that they provide. Now, there's a lesson there for us as well, even though many of us would not count ourselves, or many of you, I guess, wouldn't count yourselves ministers and going out and uh, building up as Paul was doing here. Uh, But he says that when we labor, we get rewarded according to the labor that it is that we do. And that's important for us to remember that our labor is not worthless to God, that it has value to him. But when the rest of us all decide we're going to divide around whose labor is better, He says that's foolish and immature. And so let's remember that as well. If you think someone here is more important than someone else because of the work that they do, Paul says that's immature and foolish. That's carnal. If you think that Kevin is more important than someone else because I get up and preach most weeks, you're acting like babies. We have to remember that any time we raise up man 
to a place that he doesn't belong in, where acting as carnal men do. And the reason that is, he says, is in verse 6 and 7, really, right? Because it's God that gives the increase. The other important thing that we want to remember or grab out of what it is that Paul is saying here is that God is the one who causes growth. Now, that's important for two reasons. The first is this, that the labor that we do is important, but not the results. And that seems really weird, right? Because we live in a society and in a world that is results-driven. It is results-oriented. But what Paul is saying here is that when we work for God, when we labor for him in whatever it is that we are doing, the labor is what's getting rewarded regardless of how many people get converted because of it, regardless of how much growth happens on that other side, regardless of whether or not the person that you taught remains faithful their whole life or turns around and runs away, he says it's not important because it's God that gives the increase. All that God cares about is the labor that you put in. And the second reason that's important to us is because we have to remember that we shouldn't attribute to man what belongs to God. Right? That's what the Corinthians were doing. They were saying, oh, so-and-so is such a much better teacher here. He's come through and look at all the growth that's happened while this person was here compared to while that person was here. So he clearly must be better, and because I believed under that regime, therefore I am better as well. And Paul says that's silly because it's God that gave the increase no matter what. And we've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating again. I can't make anything grow. Right? I mean, we like to think that sometimes, that I planted, I watered it, I did all these things, and look, I made that plant grow. But did I really? No, all I did was provided good conditions. Who made it grow? Right? Who made that thing grow? And you know how you can test that out? Go buy some seeds. It's a real fun experiment. Go buy some seeds this year, and then put them away in your cupboard. Or, you know, what you usually do is you plant a few of them, and you save the rest because you're going to use them later. Right? And you keep them in your cupboard, and then 10 years go by or whatever, and you try and get those seeds out again. And you plant those in the ground, and you water them, and what happens? Most of the time, nothing. Right? They're not viable that long. Most seeds, you have a year or two at the most to plant them. You go get those old seeds, and you plant them. And you plant them, and you water them, and you do everything. And then you go, grow, grow, grow. Will it grow? No. You can't make anything happen that belongs to God to make happen. And so we must remember that anything that good that happens here, any benefit that we gain from the growth that happens at this place is all to be attributed to God and not to each other. The second metaphor that Paul wants to talk about, important for us as well, is down there again, beginning in verse 9, that we are God's building. And in verse 16 and 17, he expands on that idea. We're jumping over uh, verses 10 through 15 because that's really a warning towards those other ministers who were there in Corinth at the time, uh, who had been coming through there. Uh, that's really who that's for. And while that might be beneficial to a very few of us here who would be in that role of building and ministering, it's not useful to the large group as a whole so much as the second metaphor Paul has to talk about. 16 and 17, he says, don't you know or don't you understand that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles or destroys the temple of God, him God also will destroy for the temple of God is holy and that's whose temple you are. The second metaphor Paul wants the people to understand is that you are God's building, right? You're God's building. Now, we're here. We thought we were a garden two seconds ago, but now Paul switches it up and says, no, 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 I'm changing that now. Now you're a building. Let me tell you a different thing that's important here. Now, the reason he wanted to talk about fields is because he wanted to talk about service and he wanted to talk about growth. The reason he wants to talk about buildings is because God's building is a special building, right? It's not like my building or your building. God's building is always the temple, right? When you say you're God's building, you mean you are the temple. That's his building. And what he says there, he says, don't you understand or don't you know that you're God's temple? You're his building. Now, why is that important? Why is it important for us to remember that we collectively are the temple of God? Well, there's a couple of things there that Paul wants us to understand. And the first one is this, that just like buildings aren't built by us, if we are the building, Right? If we're the building, we didn't build ourselves. 
In the same way, we have to remember that things are built, or the temple of God here is built, by others, by other people. Now, that seems strange to us sometimes, but think about it in this way. How many times in the New Testament especially uh, are we told to build up and to edify someone else? How many times are we told to build up ourselves? I bet if you count those up, you're going to be surprised in that most of the time our job is to build someone else. Because we think most of the time my job is to do what? Build up me. Right? I mean, that's what we think about. It's my faith. It's my thing. I'm going to work it up. I'm going to build it up. I'm going to do this for me. But what the New Testament is mostly concerned about is me building up you. And not just because I'm up here. What the New Testament is concerned about is you building up me. That's the way it works. Because we're a building, and so we don't build ourselves. We build someone else. Because buildings are built by other people besides the building itself. And that makes perfectly good sense when we think about it in that way. And the second thing that Paul wants them to understand, and it's important for us then, is because we're the temple of God, that means that God dwells in us. He dwells amongst us. Now, in the Old Testament, that picture was very clear, right? There was the building, there was the temple, and it was consecrated, and what happened? It says the Spirit of God, the cloud, came down, and the glory lived in the building. Like, it was there. You could see it. And people were afraid to even go near the temple because of that. And when the temple, when the glory got up and moved, you know what the people did? Nope, it's time to get move. In the tabernacle days. In the temple days, when they consecrated, the same thing happened. The temple was built, it was consecrated, the glory of God came down and inhabited, lived there in the temple. And you know what would be really crazy? Is if we could literally see that today. You imagine that? Like if every time when we came in and it got to be 3 o'clock and we were all there and getting ready and you know, sitting down and being ready to start, you know, and you know how we can tell it's time to get started because everyone sort of gets quiet? right, a little bit, and then you're like, oh, those kids, and those kids eventually quiet down too. Wouldn't it be weird if at 3 o'clock the glory of the Lord literally descended <laughs> into the building here, and you're like, oh, God is here. How would that change the way you behaved? Would it? The answer is it shouldn't, right? I mean, that, the answer is it shouldn't change it at all. Because if we really understand we're the temple of God, then we know that God dwells here with us, whether we can see it or whether we can't. And the reason why that's so important to the Corinthians, and the reason it's equally important to us is this. How will God treat the person who defiles the temple? Now, we could guess at that. We could speculate on it. But we don't really have to, right? Because we've seen time and time again in the Old Testament how God treated those people who defiled his holy things, right? What happened to those people? I mean, you don't have to, like, name them because if I say, what happened to the people that defiled the temple or the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the answer is basically always the same, right? It's what? He destroyed them. He killed them. That's what he did, right? Nadab and Abihu, strange fire on the altar, what happens? Destroys them. That's what happens. Someone touches the ark, Uzzah touches the ark, what happens? Destroys him. That's what God does. If you don't treat as holy the things which are holy and belong to God, God just wipes that person out. That's what he does. And what Paul says is we need to keep that same mindset today. If we believe that we all collectively are the temple of God and God is dwelling among us, then I need to be really careful that I'm building you and not tearing you down. Because if I tear you down, if I defile the temple of God, God destroys those people. We have to remain holy. We have to remain set apart for the work that it is that God has prepared this group for. And you know when we can't do that? It's the same way or the same time as when the Corinthians couldn't do that. We can't do that if we're not being holy, right? If we're not being spiritual, if we're not being mature, if we're not growing up in Jesus Christ, but instead we're acting like just mere men, we're acting like the world, we're acting like carnal people, 
Well, carnal is the opposite of holy. Things set apart are the opposite of those things which are just like everything else or like everyone else. And so if we're dividing, if we're envious, if we're causing strife among the brethren, if we're having these kind of problems, we're acting like babes, it's not just a little deal. It's not just a small thing. It's defiling the temple of God, and God destroys those who do that. And so we need to take mind of that. We need to take thought of that. And we need to make sure that we spend our time building each other up and not tearing each other down. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we come to you and we thank you for this time that you've blessed us with and this time that you have uh, spent with us here. We understand that we are your temple and that you dwell among us, Father, and we are so grateful that we have this communion with you, uh, this ability to talk with you and be in your presence because of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to recognize and realize that uh, we are spiritual when we act spiritual and that we are carnal when we act that way. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to uh, grow up into Jesus Christ and do that by putting off the carnal things of the world. Father, we pray that you would help us to uh, each in our own lives put off strife and envy and division, Father, and we pray that uh, as a group that you would help us to put those things off collectively as well. Father, we pray that you would help us to see and to understand that it is our job to build one another up and not tear each other down. We pray that you would help us to see and understand that we are your field and that the blessings that we receive are because you're giving the increase here, Father, and we pray that you would help us to see that each of us labors and works for you and you'll reward that, but that it's the results that get credit that belong to you and not to us. Father, we pray that you would help us to grow in this place. We pray that you would help us to be built up in this place. and We pray that we would do that as we come to know more of your spirit, to know more of your deep things that you revealed to us, to know more of the things that you've prepared for us because of the time that we spend uh, in communion and in study with you. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we do leave this place and go back out into the world, that we would remember that even when we are apart from each other, that we're still your field, that we're still your temple and your building, and that we would act and live in a way that's according with that. Father, we're so grateful for Jesus that uh, he came and that it is through his sacrifice that we can have this special relationship of being your field and being your temple. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.